Good afternoon. My name is Diane Marie Amen. I am the Regents Professor of International Law and the Woodruff Chair in International Law here at the University of Georgia School of Law. And I'm your host today for our really impressive event entitled Civil Rights Queen, a conversation with author Tamiko brown Nagan. She is the Dean at the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study, the Daniel P.S. Paul Professor of Constitutional Law, and Professor of History in the Faculty of Arts and Sciences at Harvard University. She holds a Bachelor's in History, summa cum laude, from Furman University, a PhD in History from Duke University, and a JD from Yale, where she was editor of the Yale Law Journal. A frequent commenter on law and social change in the United States, she is, among many other things, a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and the International Women's Forum. We here at the University of Georgia hosted this distinguished legal scholar and historian in 2011 at the University Chapel, where she discussed her first book, Courage to Dissent, Atlanta and the Long History of the Civil Rights Movement a book which won six awards, including the prestigious Bancroft Prize. And so it is a great honor for me to welcome Dean Brown Megan to present her new book, the first major biography of Constance Baker Motley, who lived from 1921 to 2005, and as we soon will learn, was a pathbreaking lawyer, politician, and judge. In so doing, Dean Brown Nagan is delivering our law school's 120th Sibley Lecture. The Sibley Lecture Series was established in 1964 by the Charles Lauridans Foundation of Atlanta in tribute to the late John A. Sibley, a 1911 graduate of this law school. Previous lectures have included an array, indeed a pantheon, and I say that because the, the publisher of this book is Pantheon Books, um, indeed, a pantheon of scholars, judges, and policymakers. Among them were Horace Ward, the judge who in 1950 was the first Black person to seek admission to Georgia law, albeit unsuccessfully, and Earl Warren, who, as Chief Justice of the United States, wrote the 1954 opinion that outlawed segregation and education. Both individuals figure in the book that Dean Brown Nagan is going to discuss with us. It is entitled Civil Rights Queen, Constance Baker Motley and the Struggle for Equality, and was issued just two weeks ago by Pantheon Books. And so without further ado, let us turn to that discussion. Dean Brown Nagan first will introduce her book and then will engage in a conversation with me about it. Thereafter, we will open the floor to question and answer. Therefore, throughout our discussion, please post your own questions um, to Dean Brown Megan via the chat function in the Zoom box below. Dean Brown Megan, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Amen, for moderating this event. It is a pleasure for me to return uh, to an audience at the University of Georgia. Thanks to your Dean, Peter Rutledge, for the invitation to give the Sibley Lecture and to all in your events team who helped to organize today's lecture. I am delighted to be uh, here to talk about my book, uh, The Biography of Constance Baker Motley. I'm looking forward to engaging in uh, conversation with you, with the audience. Uh, and uh, first, though, I thought that I would uh, start with an overview of Motley's life and work for those who are not familiar with her. Then I'll briefly read a passage from the book, and finally we can turn to questions and comments. Now, the title of my book, Civil Rights Queen, is taken from a journalistic account of one of Motley's trials. It's the uh, trial uh, suing Clemson University. The reporter called her the civil rights queen after being just so impressed by her. On that occasion, and really so many others, Motley simply captivated observers. Uh, people had rarely seen a woman lawyer or a black lawyer, and she was just this extraordinary combination, uh, a black woman lawyer. It was her novelty and her talent 
that made her an icon of equality uh, and the counterpart of Thurgood Marshall. Now, she was a fascinating subject for me because she lived such a full life. Uh, she had a three-phased career, and I was interested in the question of how her social justice commitments found expression in each of the three phases of her career when she was engaged in distinct professional roles. And let me tell you about those three phases. First, she was a civil rights lawyer working for the NAACP Legal Defense Fund for some 20 years. During her long career at the Inc. Fund, as it's called, Motley developed a reputation as an excellent lawyer. She argued in one night of 10 cases at the U.S. Supreme Court, the first Black woman known to argue at the court. And she worked on a range of truly important uh, landmark cases, including Brown versus Board of Education, of course, one of the most important cases in 20th century constitutional law. And then after working on Brown, she uh, co-counseled on a series of, of cases, including the one that desegregated uh, the University of Georgia, also Ole Miss, University of Alabama, and on and on. As if that uh, was not enough, after she made history as a civil rights lawyer, Motley made history in an entirely different realm, this in politics. Uh, in 1965, New Yorkers voted her Manhattan borough president, the first female to hold that position, and she went into that position from uh, uh, a perch in the New York State Senate, uh, where she was the first Black woman to sit in that chamber. And then in 1966, President Lyndon Johnson appointed her federal judge. Uh, when she won confirmation to the United States District Court in Manhattan, she was the first Black woman ever appointed to a federal judgeship, and only the fifth woman, by the way, to be appointed to the federal bench. And so Motley was truly a remarkable figure who did remarkable things. Uh, so this is a biography, but it's not only that. It's really a story about change in 20th century America that is told through Motley's life and work. And I make that claim because over her seven decades in public life, Motley really embodied change and also made change in uh, society and in law. And so I assert that she stands beside her mentor, Thurgood Marshall, as a symbol of uh, the second American revolution. And she joins her client, Thurgood, excuse me, Martin Luther King Jr. as the personification of America's struggle to overcome slavery. Uh, so in addition to making those claims uh, about her place in history, I also in this book um, seek to convey some insights about gender and leadership, uh, about social change and the judicial role. And I should explain further that when Motley was appointed to the bench, civil rights groups and women's rights groups were overjoyed. Um, they thought that surely she would be able to uh, advance the struggle for equality. They had one of their own on the bench. Um, Motley, of course, was a part of a, a first wave of jurors to, um, who diversified the bench. And what I do in my book is to consider how her uh, career sheds light on um, what you might call the risks and rewards of that project of uh, assuming that uh, diversity on the bench will yield particular outcomes. And third, I meditate on the James Baldwin question of what is the price of the ticket? Um, and I'm happy to talk to you about all of those questions and more. But first, I do want to read from the chapter of my book on Motley's judicial confirmation. And of course, I chose this chapter because uh, it happens that the book has been released at a very timely moment when we are about to, uh, it, it seems, uh, see an African-American woman appointed to or nominated to the Supreme Court. And so 
uh, I thought you might want to hear about Motley's experience. For months, Motley had been expecting a call about her application for a judicial appointment, but discussions had dragged on, and after waiting so long, she could no longer be certain that the Plum Prize would ever materialize. President Lyndon Baines Johnson's summons meant that perhaps her time had finally come. Johnson greeted Motley at the White House, seated his large, imposing frame across from her, and told her the news she was hoping to hear. Well, we're going to announce your appointment to the bench today. The president planned to nominate Motley to a federal judgeship, the honor of a lifetime. She thanked Johnson, the president she would credit with finally, quote, taking the bull by the horns to make monumental strides in support of black freedom. Motley beamed with gratitude and pride. The full significance of the moment continued to dawn on Motley as Johnson described how thoroughly her nomination had been vetted. He had, he told her, discussed her qualifications with luminaries from all walks of life, each of whom had backed her appointment. In his decision to nominate Motley for the bench, Johnson had received enthusiastic support from every civil rights leader in the country, Supreme Court justice and other federal judges. Johnson wanted to take full credit from these leaders and all onlookers for his pathbreaking achievement, his desire to live up to the transformational reputation of his political idol, Franklin Roosevelt, motivated uh, in part Johnson's appointment of Motley, but so did the lobbying of many activist groups. The next day, a picture of Motley and Johnson appeared on the front page of the New York Times. Mrs. Motley is chosen for a federal judgeship here, the headline blared. The accompanying story observed that the selection of the then borough president for the judgeship had been some time coming and that there was little doubt that the U.S. Senate would confirm her for the post. Despite this high praise, the article's certainty that Motley's confirmation would be a cinch proved wrong. The perfect optics of that day at the White House concealed what was happening behind the scenes. Motley's stellar record as a civil rights litigator and her prominent role in New York politics had not insulated her nomination from criticism. The confirmation process proved arduous. If Motley's ascent symbolized the rise of women and black people, her battle for confirmation was a harbinger of the fits and starts that all outsiders would encounter as they sought access to power in America. Ironically, it was Motley's famed career as a civil rights lawyer that slowed her bid for uh, the Senate's confirmation. Wielding the power of his chairmanship of the Judiciary Committee, Senator James Eastland held up Motley's nomination for months. A wealthy plantation owner known by the trademark cigar that dangled from his lips, Eastman also was known for his daily consumption of scotch. He defended white supremacy like his life depended on it. From the floors of the U.S. Senate, Eastland's tall frame erect, his two tight spectacles pinching the temples of his large round head, his thinning hair combed to the left, Eastland railed against the mongrelization of the races. These rant, rants had earned Eastland a reputation as the voice of the white South, as had his adamant opposition to Brown versus Board of Education, which had, quote, destroyed the Constitution. He was not going to let the nomination of the Black woman civil rights lawyer who desegregated his alma mater, Ole Miss, slide quietly to confirmation in the Senate. Practiced in the tactics of delay and obstruction, Eastland had led Senate opposition to the judicial appointment of Thurgood Marshall, Motley's mentor and former boss. But Senator Eastland's efforts to block Motley's appointment as a federal judge backfired. President Johnson did not pull Motley's nomination. The Judiciary Committee did not change course Numerous respected legal and political heavyweights remained in Motley's corner. New York senatorial delegation stood behind her nomination. Senator Jacob Javits, the Republican who had gotten to know Motley 
when she served as Manhattan Borough President, asked the Senate to consider her 24-year career. Mrs. Motley is a woman of great capacity, Senator Javits said, one of the principal counsels to Thurgood Marshall and a woman who had fought a great legal battle for equal rights. Senator Robert Kennedy closed ranks. He personally vouched for Motley. And so on August 30th, 1966, after a seven month delay, the Senate confirmed Motley's appointment as U.S. District Judge in New York, New York, despite the objections of Senator Eastland. Motley had achieved her most impressive feat yet. A White House memorandum announced Motley's appointment. Its one word header simply said, first. Constance Baker Motley was the first Negro woman ever appointed to a lifetime federal judgeship, read the memo. The appointment symbolized, it said, that the Negro is on his way and that doors are opening on every side. Newspapers all over the country covered Motley's appointment. Many emphasized her rise from working class New Haven to the pinnacle of the legal profession. A Virginia Daily illustrated the wonder of Motley's achievement. Lady Lawyer's Cinderella story comes to a happy end, its headline read. For a civil rights and women's rights group that hailed her achievement, Motley's personal triumph also signified that oppressed groups would have a friend on the court. At the headquarters of the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, Motley's workplace for 20 years, staff members cheered. With one of their own on the bench, supporters were sure that the quality of justice meted out in the courts could only improve. Motley herself had encouraged this kind of thinking. During her wait for confirmation, she told a reporter for an African-American newspaper that with her appointment to the bench, America is about to make good on its promise of equal opportunity for all. Thank you. And I'm ready for your questions, Professor Amen. Yes, and thank you for reminding me that I needed to turn on uh, the <laughs> unmute. <laughs> that was a very, very smooth way of doing it. <laughs> um, really terrific passage to read from what is just a masterful book. But, but let me push you on it a little bit. Um, you chose that. In, are you suggesting to us a cautionary tale about what we're about to uh, see unfold with the impending nomination, uh, the hoped for Cinderella ending? Do you have any thoughts on that particular uh, event? Uh, sure. Well, I, I do think it's important to be cautious. Um, I do think it's important to emphasize that, although, uh, as I said, many people were sure that, that Motley would just have an easy uh, uh, time after she was nominated, that, of course, was not true um, because of the surrounding uh, racial dynamics, gender dynamics. Uh, and, of course, Motley had a record behind her. And not everybody liked that record. And so to that extent, it is a cautionary tale. Of course, many decades have passed. Um, this nomination has been a long time coming. And yet, uh, Professor Amen, we've already seen a lot of rhetoric uh, bandied about um, calling into question uh, um, the president's commitment uh, in terms that um, uh, you know, are, are quite disappointing. On the other hand, there are a lot of people who are eager for this appointment and they're celebratory. Uh, and uh, I think it's, I think it's important to, um, to just, just appreciate that these nominations uh, are very tricky uh, and trickier still in the context of a breakthrough appointment. Yes, that's exactly right. And I think one of the, the real values of history in a moment like this is to remind us that, that these sorts of events are part of a long struggle. That's that, um, what we are beginning to see unfold, really the, the polar opposites of criticism and celebration um, have, have 
their own uh, ancestors in the nominations of individuals like Thurgood Marshall, um, as well as Constance Baker Motley. Yes. Um, let me ask you one other thing in, in that genre. You, you mentioned that, that several uh, uh, speakers after her confirmation was complete um, saw her arrival as augering a change in the way the justice system would work. But you have a really interesting analysis in your book about the limits of the judicial role and, and how um, both her personality and her understanding of the position may have circumscribed the ability to, to which she could become then an agent of social change as a judge. Maybe if you could talk a little bit about that. Sure. Uh, once again, in the book, I do um, offer some cautions and, and uh, want to probe a little bit on the assumption that there is a necessary relationship between identity and outcomes in legal cases. Um, you know, we, we, we ought to know um, that that is true. And yet I think that... Um, I will say that every time I have explained to people um, Motley's record on the bench, people are just sort of surprised and, and some a little skeptical that uh, she didn't every single time reach the conclusion that uh, one might have expected her to reach given her background as a civil rights lawyer. In fact, I argue it was a double-edged sword. Um, it, it obviously gave her prominence and was a, a factor in her elevation to the bench. On the other hand, um, there were lawyers, including in a landmark sex discrimination uh, case under Title VII, who argued that Motley could not be fair in discrimination cases because of her background. Uh, he actually wrote a letter to her saying that I believe as a Black woman, you've experienced workplace discrimination. And uh, from that, he concluded that she could not be fair uh, in that case. And so that, that um, her, her reputation was always hovering um, over uh, the, her, her, her judicial career, uh, which is not to say that she was... Um, it was shadowed in a way that was debilitating. It was not, um, but it is to say that any number of um, factors have to be considered uh, in judging. Um, it, it's, it's not the case, even on the Supreme Court, I don't think um, that um, it judges, uh, even if they were so inclined, can just, you know, um, push for their own values. There's precedent to be considered, um, certainly for a trial court uh, judge. There are professional norms um, that have to be considered. For Motley, um, you know, she, in part because she was under scrutiny, but in part because she believed um, that uh, judging was a limited enterprise. Um, uh, she was she was careful. Uh, she was careful. Um, and in, say, Title VII cases, I found that um, she was just as likely, really, to scrutinize those cases. She could see when a case was a good case because of her background. And so the, just the assumptions that are made um, uh, did, not, uh, did not follow for a variety of reasons. Although, as I discussed in the book, she issued rulings as a judge that are very important, some rulings that uh, implemented the Civil Rights Act, uh, a ruling in a prisoner's rights case that was just a, a landmark case and uh, many others. I'll pause there and, and, and let you uh, ask another question. Let's turn to her role as a lawyer. And one of the, the, the questions that I've received is, is, is a request to discuss some of her cases. And I think I'd like to frame it this way, which is to ask, uh, what do you see as her greatest achievement as a lawyer? I believe when she received the Presidential Medal, president, it, there, you know, there were references to certain cases. I believe when she passed away, uh, Barack Obama 
president then uh, referred to her work on ground. But what do you see as her greatest achievement as an attorney? Mm. Well, uh, Professor, her cases in the field of education certainly stand out as 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 life changing, as creating opportunity um, for students at the K through 12 level who have been subjected to Jim, Jim Crow schools, as well as in higher education. She essentially desegregated higher education in the South uh, in a range of cases, Clemson, Alabama, Georgia, and Ole Miss, a case that she called the last battle of the Civil War. And then, of course, there were a number of um, uh, cases uh, at the secondary level, including most famously Brown versus Board of Education, um, which we, we have to cite as being a, a truly significant case and a part of her legacy. Although a point that I make in the book is that Motley, um, she, she wrote the original complaint in the case. She worked on the briefs. Uh, she was the only woman lawyer listed. And yet um, she was not as central to the case as, as Thurgood Marshall or Jack Greenberg. She didn't argue. Um, she herself talks about doing a lot of the, the grunt work. So behind the scenes and I point out that, um, and it's important to point out, no one else has, that um, when Motley was helping to litigate Brown, she was also becoming a mother for the first uh, time and the only time. Um, and so the pregnancy, childbirth, infancy, uh, and her, her son's um, toddler years coincided with all of that work on Brown, which is just incredible. And so I, I use that to discuss um, uh, the fact that we are looking through, looking at the civil rights movement through the eyes of a woman, through the lens of gender, and it's important to do so. Uh, and I'll just mention, because of location, that she did, um, she litigated the Atlanta school desegregation case all the way to the Supreme Court. But I also think that the uh, number of cases that she litigated on behalf of the civil rights movement, the protest side, are very important, including one out of Birmingham, uh, just a number of cases. She was she was just so central to all of the movement's achievements. And I am just uh, so honored to have been able to write this book and make it clear to everyone that she was right there in the thick of it alongside uh, Thurgood Marshall and some other lawyers who are better known. Yes, and, and you do a masterful job of, of uh, really putting her in the frame where she belonged and also remarking on some of the other women um, both within the civil rights movement, uh, Ella Baker, Holly Murray, et cetera, as well as the larger women's movement. We would think of Bella Absolut, who I think was a classmate of hers, um, sort of where they fit in and where perhaps they weren't allowed to fit in at the time. Um, I have a question from a student. Uh, while reading the book, the difference between Motley's mistakes in the University of Alabama case and the success in the University of Georgia case struck me. Do you believe that Motley learned from her mistakes in the Alabama case, um, or were there factors about the UGA case that, that made it an easier win than the Alabama case? Sure, that's a great question. I'm happy to answer. The Alabama case came before the Georgia case, and of course the law evolved uh, over time. The NAACP um, just kept racking up wins uh, that established, reaffirmed that uh, state mandated racial segregation was now unlawful. And so in that sense, the UGA case um, uh, was a, a lighter lift, but it's not only that. The distinction, the main distinction between the cases um, would have to be the plaintiffs. So in the Alabama case, um, there were, as I describe in the book, there were initially two plaintiffs, one of whom uh, was subject to character assassination 
um, by the University of Alabama because she had uh, become pregnant before she was married. And this was certainly a, a bone of contention in the case. And Motley, frankly, didn't have any problem or certainly didn't articulate one with um, the, the, the state's pushback against the client because she believed in the politics of respectability and the NAACP lawyers believed that they needed to have um, the, the most straightforward, best uh, uh, facts and best plaintiffs as measured by conventional uh, standards, social standards, um, educational standards to win their cases. So the UGA case was um, uh, more straightforward in that respect because it, there, as Motley herself said, they had uh, perhaps the best plaintiffs ever in Hamilton Holmes and Charlene Hunter Galt. Uh, they were in many ways traditional. Um, they were, you know, people use the term black excellence these days. So they were that. Uh, Hamilton Holmes being from uh, a family of physicians, from an activist family. Um, and I say in the book that it, he, he looks all American, whatever that conjures, except for his race. Um, and Charlene Hunter Galt was similarly situated, a standout in high school um, uh, and, and, you know, attractive, striking, physically striking, and all of that um, played into, uh, I think, the, 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 um, the NAACP's uh, perception that the, the case that the plaintiffs were uh, great plaintiffs. But of course, neither case um, was uh, a walk in the park. Uh, the University of Georgia um, made things difficult for the, the plaintiffs, um, uh, arguing that race was not in fact a factor in the admission of students. And Motley had to spend, and her co-counsels had to spend an extraordinary amount of time and energy proving otherwise by looking through all of those files, uh, student application files, uh, and cross-examining the registrar and showing that in fact, race did uh, seem to matter and not in the favor of black plaintiffs. Um, and uh, the other thing that I wanna point out in talking about the UGA, UGA case in particular is just how much um, sacrifice these lawyers had to make um, to litigate this case and others. They had to drive back and forth between Athens and Atlanta every day because there was no place for them to stay in Athens, no restaurants where they could eat uh, at in Athens. And so it was it was exhausting. I've driven that that um, that uh, length between Atlanta and Athens. It seems like it's not that far, but in fact, uh, it, it just gets to be very tiring. And imagine doing that every day. Uh, so I'll stop there and and let you ask another question. Well, and that and we also need to remember that in that same period, and this has just always struck me, um, individuals like Motley and Marshall had very few places to eat when they were arguing before the Supreme Court that that uh, the the segregation of public accommodations was just profound, even for those who, as you say, had reached a level of excellence within, as it was understood then, in their own communities. Um, we have so many questions right now. Um, one of them I think I'd like to ask you to address is, is uh, the reach of the book is beyond an academic audience, right? There are many vivid uh, uh, discussions of different individuals, contextualization of the place, who do you hope is your audience and what do you want them to learn from the book? Mm -hmm. Well, as I say in the introduction to the book, I really aspire to make Motley, um, her story available, accessible and known by the widest possible audience. Uh, so by now in our history, 
You know, Thurgood Marshall is a household name among uh, attentive and educated people. The same is true of Martin Luther King Jr. Um, there, there are very few women uh, whose contributions have been so recognized or who are so recognized. Rosa Parks, certainly, um, uh, I would say. And yet Motley is playing a different role. She is a professional woman arguing a lawyer in a uh, traditionally male profession. And it's important for her uh, to be known as such. She is singular, uh, even setting her apart from uh, some other women in the civil rights movement. Happy that Pauli Murray is, is getting a lot of attention um, as she should. But my aspiration for Motley is that and my highest aspiration would be uh, that if she were a household name like Marshall and, and um, uh, Martin Luther King Jr., it's important to, um, to correct history. Uh, it's important to um, inspire those people for whom her visible diversity matters. And it's important to talk about um, the civil rights movement and the women's rights movement from the perspective of gender, the limitations, continuing limitations uh, of gender on uh, career paths, um, the uh, reality of juggling uh, professional life and a home life. There's so many lessons in there uh, uh, in this book, and I, I'm just delighted to be able to offer it uh, to people and in such a timely a moment. Thank you. We have a student who observes that even today, the percentages of uh, attorneys who are Black in the United States is incredibly low. And the question is, given this statistic, what do you see as the biggest obstacle for people of color who are trying to enter the legal profession, whether they aspire to become a federal judge like Motley or, or to enter some other realm of the legal profession? Mm -hmm. I will answer that by um, reminding the audience or informing the audience of something I read just the other day. And that is that uh, uh, Judge Jackson, who is one of the evidently one of the contenders for the uh, Supreme Court nomination, um, developed a desire to be a lawyer when she was very young. Uh, I believe it's an elementary school. You know, the same was true of me. Um, and, and so that is to say, one has to start early um, in, in developing these aspirations or at least seeing the possibilities. Um, that's vitally important. And then one has to um, actually uh, pursue educational tracks and endeavors that prepare one for the courses of study um, that are required in undergraduate years and then during law school. In other words, in order to um, be well positioned to pursue a law degree, one has to start pretty early. Uh, it, it can't be something that um, it, one is not well situated if, you know, the, the, uh, idea only arises um, you know, late in one's life. Uh, so I think um, putting those opportunities, creating those possibilities for people uh, early on, uh, and also ensuring that students have the access to quality education um, that is required to be prepared, have role models, um, all of those things matter for um, students of color just the same as they matter for white students, right? And so uh, I am I'm entirely supportive of uh, efforts uh, made by uh, any number of organizations to um, make it uh, clear to students that a career in the law uh, is a viable one and, and very disappointed that still it is true uh, that there's such a there's such underrepresentation of African Americans in particular in the law. I want to invite you in our closing minutes to answer 
Baldwin's question from the view of your subject. What is the price of the ticket through the lens of the life of Constance Baker Motley? Sure, very important question. And uh, the, the answer is that there are personal costs um, to rising to the top of the legal profession when one is an outsider. And those costs have to do with um, compromises and sacrifices that need to be made on the way um, to that point, to the top of the profession, some of which I, I've already discussed. But it's also the point um, that it's not that easy, ultimately, um, to change the world, uh, even from positions of authority and power. There are many constraints on doing so. Um, the, the system itself uh, is a constraint, its norms, its rules. Uh, certainly that was true for Motley in her judicial role. And so I, I want people to reflect at the end of the day on um, uh, how it can be not the best idea to put so much weight on these symbols of opportunity and change. It's vitally important. I fully support it. Don't want to be read as saying anything else. And yet, whether it's Constance Baker Motley or even Barack Obama, um, there are a lot of factors that ultimately determine if the interests of communities of color, women, uh, other historically marginalized groups can find expression in law and policy. That is the price of the ticket. Well, thank you. And, and I, I found it interesting when you referred to her as a symbol because um, I think part of the project in your book is to do something that, that, that uh, to use a phrase that you use with regard to, to Thurgood Marshall, to show her full personhood. And so would you say it's fair that you're, you're, you're also writing against the symbol or trying to um, show us uh, who the symbol really was, to get past that idea of Constance Baker Motley as icon alone? Absolutely, it is. Uh, nevertheless, she was a symbol. But the, the project of the book is to show the full range of her humanity um, to, uh, to show that uh, even these icons have to make choices and do make choices that um, not everybody might appreciate. Uh, sacrifices, uh, you know, I ended up through the writing of this book really admiring Constance Baker Motley, uh, but everyone makes choices, uh, some of which one might view dimly. Uh, and yet it's important as a, a mature reader, indeed as mature citizens of this country, to appreciate the nuances, the choices. Uh, and also, I think, um, Professor Amen, that doing that actually is empowering. Um, so if we get beyond the symbol, um, perhaps it can be inspiring for people who could never see themselves as meeting the standards or whatever it is people think about when they see symbols themselves. One doesn't need to be perfect. One can be a human and nevertheless achieve incredible things. Well, I can't think of a better place to end our conversation, although I would be delighted to continue to talk uh, for much longer. And indeed, I have enough questions to do just that. <laughs> We need to uh, close this conversation. Thank you again so much, Dean Brown Megan, for uh, sharing with us your insights on the book. Congratulations on a wonderful effort. And uh, we look forward to your next visit once <laughs> you've written your third book. Thanks to Thank the you. audience. And uh, thanks again to the Laura Dance Foundation. Goodbye. Thank you.